everybody who's with us, wherever you're joining us from. Uh, you're all very welcome to this, our first GDI expert series of webinars. My name is Fiona Farrell and I am the CGIR System Senior Advisor on Gender Diversity and Inclusion in CGIR's workplaces, which is a big mouthful. So put it more simply, um, I'm in GDI. Uh, it's great that you could all join us today. Uh, it looks like we have about 99 uh, people registered to join us um, yesterday, which was uh, the first delivery of this seminar, uh, this webinar. We had about 82 folks with us. So uh, we're all glad to have, have you with us today. Please, can you feel free to use your camera so we can see who you are or not, as you choose. Uh, but we do ask you to please keep muted uh, throughout the, the webinar and use the chat line on the right side of your screen as a way to communicate with us. Um, I'd like to say hi to Helen and thank you so much for joining us, Helen, because she's supporting us today in watching that chat line and making sure that we get all your questions and your thoughts and your insights throughout the next hour that we spend together. Feel free to use that uh, Zoom chat line right now to say hi to everyone. Let us know where you're calling in from, where you're joining us from, and throughout the next hour, add any comments or thoughts or questions uh, as they arise to you. Helen is watching very carefully. And uh, at the end of our chat session, there will be a formal Q&A uh, where Helen will make sure we get all your questions picked up as far as possible and we get our, the experts that are joining us today uh, to, to give their insights. At the end of the, the session today, the webinar, there will be a little survey, a very short survey monkey that will uh, turn up in the right hand side of your, your uh, Zoom group chat line. Uh, and if you can click on that at the end and tell us how you felt the webinar went, uh, your feedback would be very useful to us. So it looks like we got lots of folks online. Let's get started. You're very welcome. As a little background to this webinar, in late January 2020, uh, we as CGIOR, we reaffirmed our shared commitment to advancing gender equity, diversity and inclusion in our global workplaces. We did that uh, by adopting a new GDI framework and action plan for 2020 and 2021. Now these two documents, these key documents were developed using a very robust consultation process that lasted many months and many of you gave inputs to that process. Since January, uh, when those documents were adopted, we now have a newly formed system GDI function, which has been hard at work supporting HR directors um, and other colleagues as we collaborate to implement a whole new range of exciting GDI activities. Now, a crucial part of my job in my role uh, is to support the knowledge sharing and build shared GDI capacity across the system. So over the coming months and years, we'll be sharing guides and resources and training and a whole range of, of other supports, including running webinars like this one on a variety of relevant GDI subjects. So this first webinar is focused on wellness in the time of COVID-19. It's being held twice in respect for the different global time zones that we operate in. So this is the second one. We did the same thing yesterday and got a whole bunch of colleagues there. Um, so for those colleagues who can't join us either yesterday or today, we're recording today's session so that uh, the recording will be made available on the upcoming GDI Knowledge Hub. Uh, looks like we've, we've got a, a huge group with us now, which is marvellous. So let's get started. What are we talking about? Well, we're talking about living and working in unusual times. COVID-19 is currently impacting millions of folks worldwide, leading to many countries and, and organizations encouraging or requiring their employees to work from home. And, and we're not unusual in CGI or in that way. This has presented us with a whole bunch of challenges, not just in terms of the practicalities and preparedness for remote working, but also in terms of the impact on health and well-being and productivity. Research suggests that there will be additional challenges for specific groups within our workforce, such as working parents and those who may be struggling with mental health. 
So this webinar focused specifically on the impact on these more vulnerable groups and how we can not only practice self-care, but we can also support those colleagues and team members that might be struggling with the challenges of working from home. I'm joined by two experts in this area today. I'm really pleased to introduce firstly, Mohamed Nasiri, who is the Regional Director of UN Women for Asia and the Pacific and their representative in Thailand. Hi, Mohamed. <laughs> Mohamed is, is a national of Morocco. He has extensive experience in, in gender and development issues. Prior to joining UN Women, he was a Deputy Country Director for UNDP in Yemen where he supported that country in the formulation of its gender strategy and their gender responsive budgeting process. Uh, he's also worked in an area that's very close to my heart, which is on spearheading the work in engaging men and boys as agents of change, including through issuing a report on masculinities, which was the first of its kind in the Arab world. So welcome, Mohammed, and thank you for joining us. I'd also like to introduce Petra Masaika from the Rome Institute for International Counseling. Uh, Petra is an experienced mental health practitioner with extensive experience in helping both individuals and groups with personal and work related issues. Uh, and she has a particular expertise and experience in the mission driven sector. Um, her career has seen her run her own psychotherapy practice as well as establishing the Stress Counseling Unit in the UN. So she was the head of the Staff Counseling Unit for World Food Program, where she worked on the front lines of emergencies. She's now retired, and she works with individual clients as a consultant, uh, including with us, uh, providing us in CDIR with confidential counseling. And we'll talk a little bit about that counseling that's available later on today. But I'd just like to start by saying great to have you with us today, Petra. Thank you. Yes. All right. So let's, let's get started. Let's talk about remote working. Um, remote working and other flexible working options have long been at the core of many HR approaches, I mean, especially in organizations that are committed to greater diversity and inclusion. And we know that the benefits of flexible working are, are well documented for both employers and employees. And the kind of benefits that are documented include higher organizational commitment, uh, job, higher job satisfaction and job related well being. And the kind of things that have been documented include spending more time with family, uh, reduced time and stress from commuting, and the ability to be able to focus uninterrupted on work projects. But we know that's not the whole story. We know that there are also challenges related to, remote, to working remotely, and that includes uh, the risk of burnout, um, work intensification, and just a greater inability to switch off. So this pandemic is bringing us additional unique challenges, especially to working parents who we've seen have, having to play multiple roles of being a teacher, a parent and a worker. Um, this requires dealing with a whole bunch of things, including regular interruptions to their working day and increased stress in fulfilling their work obligations. Now, for those without family, enforced social isolation brings just that. It brings the risk of loneliness and isolation, and this can be compounded by increased anxiety over health concerns for themselves and others. So if we recognize that these are exceptional times, we do need new approaches, therefore, to support each other and our employees at home and at work, recognizing, of course, the really important point of intersectionality, meaning that all of us are different and we're all facing unique circumstances at home and so we can't have one size to fit all uh, we need to have a broad range of approaches so that we can work out a way of giving everybody what they need Mohammed, let me start with you um, covid 19 is presenting challenges to both women and men uh, however there is emerging evidence that in some cases COVID-19 may be disadvantaging women more. From a UN Women perspective, what are you seeing? What are the main challenges for both women and men uh, that women and men are facing during COVID-19? Over to you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Fiona, and thank you for having me today. Um, I, I really think that um, 
this crisis, uh, the scope and, and scale of it has shaken us deeply. Um, it has, as all emergencies, brought the stark inequalities in our world forward. It has changed how we communicate, how we work. For those of us uh, lucky enough to still continue to have a job, um, and it stands to test the limited hard-won gains that we've made on, on gender equality and diversity. Not surprisingly, again, uh, as we see time and time again, women are rising to the occasion, be that at the front lines as healthcare workers, in the home as caregivers, homeschool teachers, be that a source of security and comfort for their loved ones or a source of security and strength to their own communities. This pandemic has shown women's leadership, but it also has made clear the stark inequalities that underpin societies and now stand to increase if we do not address them head on and without hesitation. The health of women is adversely impacted through the reallocation of resources and priorities, including sexual and reproductive health services. Women may be at greater risk of exposure as they constitute 70% of the global health workforce um, on the front lines of response. Women often have less access to health facilities and care as well as insurance coverage. We have seen from the past pandemics that uh, as resources are shifted, um, health and sexual um, and reproductive health in particular is being impacted um, with maternal mortality levels increasing and access to contraception being blocked. Uh, the COVID-19 uh, global crisis has made starkly visible the fact that the world's formal economies and the maintenance of our daily lives are built on the invisible and unpaid labor of women and girls with children out of school, intensified care needs of older persons and ill family members and overwhelmed health services, demands for care work in COVID-19 world have intensified exponentially. Prior to the crisis, women already averaged three times more the time spent on work in the home than men. In some countries, it goes up to 11 times more than men. This figure increases exponentially in contexts with limited infrastructure where hours are spent on fetching water or firewood or meeting basic survival needs of the family. Unpaid care labor has a direct nexus with wage inequality, poverty, health stresses, and lower education income. As the COVID pandemic uh, deepens economic and social stress coupled with restricted movement and social isolation measures, gender-based violence is increasing exponentially. One in three women will experience violence in their lifetime. One in five has experienced violence in the last year alone. These women are now being forced to lock down at home with their abusers at the same time that the services to support survivors are being disrupted or made inaccessible. Rates of violence against women are spiking globally. Cities and countries are registering increases of reporting from 20% in some contexts to 40% in other contexts. For many women and girls, the threat looms where they should be safest, in their own homes. That was the basis for the Secretary General's appeal earlier last week built on his call for a global ceasefire to end violence everywhere, including violence against women in the home. And we have seen an incredible response to this call with 124 countries responding in less than 24 hours to echo the call and to commit to the response. Back to you, Fion. Thank you so much for that, that big picture perspective, Mohammed. I, so, I sometimes think it's difficult for us to, to be able to see it you know, globally and holistically. So thank you so much for, for bringing that to us. Um, I'd like to try to, to bring it a little closer to home now. I'd like to focus in on the very particular challenges that working parents are dealing with. We have many, many uh, colleagues across the system who are working parents 
bearing in mind all the things that you're learning and that you're seeing globally, what are some of the things that our managers can do to support those working parents, both women and men? It's, it's both managers and, and also HR professionals uh, in, in every business unit. And I, we know that women now take on more of the unpaid care work. Uh, and because women also earn less on the dollar almost everywhere, they are more likely to let go of their work because financially this would make sense uh, for the family where they are partnered. Um, during this challenging time when everyone has their own working from home rhythm and, and let's be realistic, not everyone has a conducive working space at home. The best we can do um, for everyone, men and women, is to exercise utmost flexibility. Work within the team on results and goals set by the team in what can realistically be achieved by when. Allow people to offline during the time of the day where they may need to homeschool or tend to sick parents or frankly just to exercise some self-care. Encourage people not to respond to emails immediately but rather when they work. For some, working hours may be after the kids are in bed. For others, it may be early morning. Uh, we must respect this pattern. Where possible, Schedule meetings that are critical in advance to allow the staff member to prepare, arrange for screen time for the kids or where they co-parent to allow the other parent to watch the kids during the meeting time. We also need to exercise forgiveness. I think this overarches everything else. It's forgiveness and kindness uh, during this period. And to remind everyone that it is not normal and that every goal met is an achievement. Work and empower your teams and stay calm and just continue on encouraging them. Back to you. Thanks so much, Mohammed. Very, very practical advice. And you know what, what you were saying there about the, the different burdens and the, you know, the, the, the particular challenges that both women and men are experiencing. I mean, I, I was reading the latest article from Cheryl Sandberg, you know, where she did an op-ed um, in the Lean In series recently. And she was talking about the fact that 31% of women in full-time jobs and families now say they have more to do than they can possibly handle, and that only 13% of working men with families stay the same, uh, say the same, which is an interesting, uh, interesting and, and sobering thought as well. Um, what I'd like to do right now is I'd like to take that, that um, point that you raised about self-care, and I'd like to go to Petra to talk a little bit more about that. I'd like to specifically talk about well-being, Petra. You know, I know that at times like this, anxiety is to be expected. I mean, we know that it's to be expected and up to a point, it's an understandable and it's a healthy response. But we also know that in stressful circumstances, sometimes this balance can tip over. Um, what should our managers be looking out for in terms of, of the mental well-being of their staff? And how can they check in to make sure everybody's mental health is okay and people are doing good? without being intrusive, because sometimes this is a sensitive area. What are your thoughts, Petra? Thanks, Fiona. Well, this is quite a difficult question because it depends on the relationship the manager has with the staff. Okay, if it's a close relationship and a real good team, uh, the manager will notice a change in behavior of his staff. And that can take all kinds of forms. It can in the performance, it can show, it can show even in the facial expression, in the body posture, how awake the person seems to be, how distracted, and so on. So I would say generally, if there is a change in behavior, it should the alarm lights in the manager should sort of go up on. Okay. And um, this, of course, yeah, if the manager is sensitive enough. If they don't know each other, then we have a real problem. And the same for the HR officer, for example. It's very difficult. As, as soon as there is a personal relationship, everything is easier. And these things can be detected very easily. But if there is a, a, a long distance, for example, then it gets to be very, very, very difficult. Now, intrusive is, depends again on the kind of relationship. Because if one is in a friendly relationship, one can easily pick up the phone and just say, hi, how are you? 
are you okay? And so on, especially if the manager knows about the family background, which I always have said in the past to managers, you need to know your staff, even how many children they have, because it's something very important. Otherwise you don't motivate them enough. So in this case, everything's fairly easy. But in case there is a distance, then of course the staff member feels abandoned, very simple. And that may even demotivate the staff member more because if there's no one picking up the phone, I've uh, come across a couple of ill people now during this crisis, physically ill people, and they say nobody calls at the office. None, none of the people calls them. Let's say maybe in the beginning, are you on sick leave? And then that's the end of it. So this is very sad, of course, for the persons, and, uh, but luckily they can have counseling help and can support from outside, can have support from outside. Thanks so much, much Petra. Now, if we had to drill it down, what would be two or three very practical things that you would suggest to our managers that they can do to support their staff's mental well-being during these difficult times? Just two or three top tips. Okay, uh, I would say because there are lots of meetings nowadays, okay, um, some people complain about too many meetings. I would say that at least once a day, the manager should say, like, make a round of asking people, how are you today? How is everything? How is the family? Because that's in many, many uh, societies is very important to include the family right away. So you say, how's the family? How are you? And make a round of about 15 minutes before you tackle any other work issues. Okay. And this as a routine is something that people will appreciate a lot. And the manager himself or herself should also participate in this. And also kind of give an understanding to him his staff or her staff, that he's also in the same boat, sitting in the same boat like everybody. Great, great practical advice. Thank you so much. Mohammed. I'd, I'd like to come back to you to touch on, you know, a very sobering and, uh, and important issue that you raised uh, in, in your, in your uh, earlier answer, Mohammed. You talked about domestic violence. Um, we know that both women and men can be victims of domestic and gender-based violence. As managers, what should we be looking out for? And if we suspect that any of our staff are at risk, what can we do to help? Recognizing that this is a sensitive area, that there are cultural differences around the world, and that people can often uh, not wish to have work colleagues uh, be seen to intrude into their personal lives. But as managers, how can we help if we do suspect that something is not quite right? We're referring to the spike in, in domestic violence as the shadow pandemic, and it really is. Uh, people are locked in, tensions mount, economic pressures rise, and violent behavior increases. No one is exempt from this, no matter the socioeconomic background, the level of education, or the perceived empowerment. This is important to remember. Domestic violence can affect anyone and everyone and the shame and the stigma associated with it equally affects everyone, including women who are seemingly empowered. Uh, it's important to create a safe space for staff, perhaps have an open door policy, share resources on gender-based violence uh, of the country where the staff are, uh, so they have a list of phone numbers handy or places to go to. Uh, in many uh, countries now, pharmacies are now doubling as a place where women can ask for help. Uh, remove the stigma from domestic violence by showcasing that it is a priority for the organization. Find out what services are available, share these uh, resources. Where we can offer free counseling, not only for the staff, but also for the immediate family members, um, counseling over Skype, for example. Um, it's important also to be on the lookout for a change in demeanor of patterns of fear, um, then reach out to the colleague and, and inquire if they wish to speak up. Um, it's difficult during these times when we cannot physically connect, um, but we can always reassure them to the extent possible virtually. Great. Th thank you very much. I, I know that you've mentioned counselling, which we'll come to, to just now. I mean, Petra, bearing all this in mind, we know a lot's going on. People are under a lot of pressure. They're juggling a lot of things right now. 
Uh, and sometimes, as we said earlier, it, it can all just be a little bit too much. Bearing all this in mind, let's talk about the support that's available for CGIR staff to deal with whatever challenges COVID-19 may be throwing at us. Now, we know that in response to these unusual times and, and the pressures that they bring, the GDI function has set aside the 700 hours of confidential counselling that's available to CGI or staff at, at no personal cost to them, in addition to whatever else is being made available then through their insurance programmes. Um, so staff can contract, contact you, Petra, at the Rome Institute to book sessions in a range of different languages and to get the support that they need. And that support is fully confidential. Now, Petra, many people may be listening to this. They may have read the GDI guides. They may have received emails. Um, and, and they're wondering, what would this confidential counseling look like? Because perhaps they've never benefited from such type of support before, but they're thinking maybe they might, they might try it. Can you please explain what a typical counselling interaction might look like? Sorry, Petra, I think you're, you're muted there. Okay, there you go. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay, usually people write to us. Okay, they send us an email and say in, in whatever words, they say that they would like contact with us. Okay, and they sometimes are very, not really sure about what they need but they just have this, uh, this, yeah, this wish to do that. And I write back right away because I'm the distributor of work sort of in our Rome Institute. I write to them and say, please let me know where you are uh, located and which language you prefer. Most of them it's English, but we do have also other language counselors so, uh, so to cover the field very well. And then usually within a day or two days, uh, the appointment is taken and then the content of the session can be anything. Of course, it has as the base the COVID-19, this anxiety, which is like a pandemic itself, okay? It's even stronger than the virus. I mean, it's more scary. And uh, so, yes, everything from family problems, personal problems, mental problems, how to manage workload. I mean, you name it, everything under the sun is presented to us. And we try to give practical advice. We try to work on options together, of course, with the client, okay, to make so that they make their own decisions. And usually the session lasts 60 minutes, so like a normal psychotherapy session. And, but it is more like a combination, let's say, between coaching and counseling because um, as we are in a very practical emergency situation, you know, it, it wouldn't really uh, be appropriate to ask about the childhood unless there is a mental disturbance, okay? And so we talk about everything under the sun, try to assist as much as we can, and we have two sessions. So that means we can also give a little task for the second uh, session to kind of think about, reflect, process things and so on, which we pick up in the second session to then sort of complete the story, okay? That's great, thank you so much, Petra. Um, now, having heard that, I mean, maybe some of the colleagues online, uh, if some of them are managers, they might think that a member of their staff could benefit from what mm -hmm. you've just described. Yeah. How can they go about introducing this counseling service and, and set their staff member up for success? What's just the, the first couple of steps they need to do? You know, if, I, if I'm honest, I would say the manager should come for counseling first, okay? Because once he or she knows what this is about, then of course he can just talk about it in a much better way. And also to say, look, this sounds okay. I've really enjoyed it. And I could say whatever I wanted. It's completely confidential and so on. Approaching the staff member, most staff members then are, of course, in a defense. Hmm? They say, oh my God, you know, now I'm, uh, go out, uh, I'm looked at as if I'm crazy. This has nothing to do with being crazy. Okay, so this is a supportive mechanism. And once the manager knows that very well, and once he has good communication skills to get the message across, because before, before he even makes a suggestion, I think he has to, to listen a lot to his staff, okay, to really find out and then say, well, look, there is this service. Why don't you take it? You can't force it. You can't, there's no way you can force it, but you can say, look, I found it very interesting and maybe this could be helpful for you. Okay, and then 
The staff member is an adult, needs to decide. Very good, very good, thank you. Um, back to you, Mohammed. I mean, I was reading the, the article this morning that, that came out, the latest one in the Harvard Business Review, that talked about um, combating burnout. That's, that's uh, the burnout that many people are experiencing from working remotely. Um, and many people coping with the various different demands on our lives. And, and in that article um, that Ellen Keith Lineburn writes, I mean, she talks a lot about, you know, the, the different types of stress that people are having and, and how they can cope with it. What would be your top tips for us in terms of maintaining wellness in COVID-19? What are you seeing that's working with other organizations? I would tie uh, this Harvard, Harvard Business Review article to another HBR article which said the best way to manage is to manage uh, by kindness. And we, we really need kindness now more than ever before and compassion and empathy. Um, it's okay to feel like, every, it's okay not to feel like um, every day is the most productive. It won't be you do the best you can with the tremendous anxiety we are feeling. Try to create a habit of differentiating between work and private life, um, as everything now is at home with limited movement, the two can easily become intertwined. Shut off work at a certain point and start your unwinding. Take lunch breaks, preferably away from laptops. If you are able to go for a walk, um, try to uh, do that. Um, eat meals uh, with loved ones if, if you're sharing the space with, with, with your family. Connect to friends virtually, maybe do a virtual quiz night or happy hours with colleagues. And if you need help, if you can't meet a deadline, communicate it. It's okay. Very, very practical. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to um, remind us that on the Zoom group chat line on the right hand side, thanks to Helen's great note taking, she's keeping note of all the tips on the right hand side that we're getting from both uh, Petra and Mohammed. Um, some questions are starting to come in. So what I will do, I will ask you to go ahead and write all your questions in the chat line now while I ask both Mohammed and Petra one last question. While they're getting ready to answer that, you can start typing and then we can go straight to your questions. So in the meanwhile, Mohammed and Petra, my final question. It's the same question to each of you. Bearing in mind everything that we're seeing globally, everything um, that people are experiencing and the, the huge amount of research and studies that are happening right now, do you have any other general advice for us on wellness in the time of COVID-19? What are the things that you really think we as CGIOR should be, should be noting and taking care of? I'll start with you, Mohammed. As an agency to lead by example and, and for the top leadership to show that they are also uh, human beings like everyone else, um, as uh, Petra rightly said earlier on, to show that we are all in this together, um, that we exercise self-care um, and we demand that our teams exercise self-care and we prioritize our um, uh, teams, the, the well-being, the, the mental health of each one of them, and then everything else comes next. And we've been doing that and, and, and uh, from a first-hand experience in what I've been doing here in, in Asia Pacific, it really, fo things fall into place. Everything else takes care of itself, but we really need to prioritize ourselves and our teams first, and we need to substantiate and showcase that. Perfect, thank you so much. Petra, over to you. I think we're, I think you're muted. I'm doing it again. Okay, <laughs> sorry. Yes. No worries. <laughs> okay, I think we have we have an option in this crisis because it's the biggest worldwide crisis that we've ever 
faced, except for enormous wars or something, but now it's the whole world. And I think what we are required to do is change and to look at life, how we lead it now, how we want to leave it, how we can live and be together with other people. It is different how we define relationships, how we also stand up as women again and not go back to patriarchy because that's what's happening at the moment because when women take the, all this load of work, that's exactly moved back, unfortunately, and that we need to take this momentum and carry it further to go again, to stand up. And I think, you know, anxiety, that is a feeling. The anxiety is something that's not, you can't grip it. It has an effect on our biochemistry in the body, of course. It has that, but we can learn to cope with it. And we can either, we have the choice to break down in this crisis or to break through. Okay, and I think that's the biggest challenge that all of us are facing at the moment. Okay, and maybe there will be more different viruses coming up. Who knows, maybe it's something that our lifestyle has to change. And, uh, but we need, to, need a lot of courage and we need a lot of compassion for ourselves and for other people in this situation. And we start with ourselves. And, and this is especially for people who suffer uh, in domestic violence, which is really tragic, or neglected children or something, that these people are protected. And in, I, see, I read a lot of articles about what's happening, how here the authorities start to identify people with the telephone numbers, with the shelters, with all kinds of things. So the world is in a big change process. And I think we need to interpret it as positive because it's our doing to make it positive, okay, our behavior. Thank you, thank you so much. I can see that there's a whole bunch of questions coming in the right hand side and as Helen is just getting them organized, I see there's one that I can answer very quickly, which is this is a question that's coming, how is the privacy of counseling sessions organized? Well, the privacy of the counseling sessions is guaranteed because the only people who are involved in the counselling is the individual who requests directly with the Rome Institute and the Rome Institute. So the, the names of the folks and all of that stuff and how many times they talk and what they talk about never actually comes through the GDI function or the, the HR departments or units or colleagues uh, within centres and alliances. The individual themselves literally contacts the Rome Institute um, and speaks directly to Petra and all we ever receive uh, is uh, the numbers of people from across the system who are contacting the Institute. So you cannot be absolutely guaranteed that if you do feel that you could benefit from such a service that you can do so in confidence that nobody is going to know that you did and that nobody is going to ask why you did it. Um, that you can talk directly uh, to Petra and her team. Okay, Helen, tell us how many questions have we got, please? Um, I don't have any. <laughs> uh, the, the ones that were asked, somebody asked for the link and somebody else very kindly put the link up and somebody asked Petra a question about um, how, um, whether, whether the, the idea is that leaders go for counseling for themselves or counseling to uh, be able to then share that with others and, and, and Petra answered it can be both. So we need, we need some more questions. You've given such thorough answers, Mohammed and Petra. <laughs> okay, thank you. We, we have one here, thank you. It says, uh, we've all been unceremoniously thrust into proactive remote working situations. The advice to be empath empathetic, insightful and sensitive to individuals' unique circumstances is well made. However, developing such work relationships is usually organic and emergent. So it'd be difficult to suddenly develop this in the time of COVID. So what I'm, what I'm getting from this question is, if we haven't had these sort of strong, very close sort of intimate relationships in the sense of knowing people for who they are with our work colleagues, how do we now transition to that now that we're working remotely? How do we begin to build Sort of stronger relationships so we can understand whether people are anxious, stressful, experiencing domestic violence or fear. Really good question, Ola. Thank you. And great summary, Helen. Okay, over to you both. Let's start with you, Petra, and then maybe Mohammed, you'd like to add something. Okay, there's another one very uh, 
Okay. You see, nobody likes to talk about his own anxiety, really, okay? Because we are brought up to imagine that we're strong, that we, can, that we are autonomous and all this kind of stuff. But we know that everybody has anxieties at the moment. I think there's no one in this world who doesn't have anxiety, if not constantly, but sometimes thinking about, my God, maybe I have to face death now. Maybe I have to face a bad illness or something like that. I think we can assume this. And as I said before, it would be good if we start to communicate more. If I we open we... up. Sorry. Sorry, was there? Would you like to jump in? Sorry. Sorry, I wasn't done. I hadn't finished yet. Sorry. Oh, no, you're back. You're back. I'm sorry. Yes, you, you froze there for me. Uh, please go ahead. I'm sorry, Petra. Go right ahead. Okay, so where was I? I don't know where it stopped. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's the joy of technology. I, go ahead. I think the most important is that we start to be honest, that we learn to be more open, not only at home, but also at work. This doesn't mean you talk about everything in your life. Of course not. It's not like gossiping or something, but that you commit to yourself, to your feelings and so on, because that's the only way, believe me, to really increase resilience, okay? You can jump around, you can jog every day, you can do all kinds of things, but you have to work also on the mental level, on, on your feeling level. Otherwise it doesn't work, it needs to go together. We are psychosomatic beings in this world, okay? We have a psyche, with all our feelings and uh, assumptions and ideas and, and problems and so on. And then we have a body and that's very, very, very much connected. In this way, we have to work on two levels to be really healthy. And this includes that we are honest with ourselves and that we don't make up anything by saying to your boss or something like that. Say, oh, I'm fine today. No problem. Okay. That is not what brings us forward. Okay, to be honest, then everybody will slowly start to open up. So this is a, a type of leadership that we need to take, starting with us. Okay, to open up and say, look, I really, I'm having a very difficult day. I couldn't focus at all. I'm so distraught for whatever reason and so on. Okay, and then it starts that it's a good working relationship and it will be more productive because agencies and institutes are there also to increase productivity. So this goes together. Psychosomatic level, psyche, body. Both need to be trained and That's not exactly. only controlled, but also, also they need to be uh, just encouraged. Let's put it that way. Great, thank you. Mohammed, over to you. Well, I'm, I'm not the expert that, that Petra is, but my understanding of the question is that in the absence of the physical interaction, the, the bonding and um, the team building becomes less organic. And, and how can we maintain that in, in uh, a virtual world? And what I, what I found that, that works for me, um, one is a very practical example and advice that Petra has actually said uh, in a few minutes ago, which is if we're having group meetings amongst our teams, we start first by genuinely asking about how we are doing. And then again, the manager can start by herself or himself to walk the talk and say, my child last night was not okay, or I feel that I'm coming down with a cold, or today I really wanted to leave the house and I cannot leave the house. So once, once the manager shows a side of vulnerability, they, 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 they come closer. Another uh, tip that I, I found that works uh, for, for ourselves here is that we, to the extent possible, uh, try to put a, a, a face to the meetings. How can to connect by the camera? And now, in many instances, our our communication technology allows that. Uh, I do understand, of course, at times um, individual staff members may not like to show their their faces, but having a human interaction, having an eye contact, makes a difference. And um, again, the, the last. Uh, tip that, that works uh, for me is to um, be again uh, trying to have side discussions the way we have side discussions 
in real life. So if we have a meeting uh, and then you have two, meet two team members who wanted to get a bit more clarity on that, they can connect together after the meeting. In, as if we're, we're having it in, 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 in lifetime. Um, I have, I'm keen to have lunch with, with my team uh, once a week. So we have lunch together over screen, not talking about work. We're just chit-chatting and, and this works. So it is not easy, but we need to make it work. And I stop here. Thank you so much. Back to you, Helen. Have we any other questions that are popping up? We do. We had one that was, um, and we had this one yesterday as well, which is the fine line between being supportive and being intrusive. So how do we check in on people, make sure they're okay, offer help without seeming like we're being intrusive? Who would like to take that first? I'm going to go to you, Patrick, because you were nodding. <laughs> <laughs> okay, should I go first? Okay, yes, okay, good. It's a very fine line between intrusive and supportive. It has to do with body posture. It has to do with facial expression. It has to be with eye contact and so on, with the way uh, the language is used. So it's a very complex thing. You know, you can't do it. For example, even for example, even if you lean back and you say something, then it feels like the person is not present, doesn't isn't really interested. So, as a manager, I think you need to learn a little bit about body language, about how to use gestures, how to use language, and especially how to listen. And listening means not talking, also not talking in your head. Okay, so these things are skills that. Uh, very easy and very nice to learn and then just kind of if, if you move a little bit forward it, it's more or less just already supportive if you move forward very much it's intrusive so you need to learn these little shades of uh, of body posture and of how you treat people and and the voice of course is very 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 important and you know we can modulate our voices we can make it lower we can make it higher softer louder more impact and so on this is uh, is this is also very playful to acquire okay for managers and especially the most important to me is to be honest okay if you are not honest in your intention the staff member will feel it okay thank you thank you I'm, I'm going to cheat a little bit, Helen, because I've seen something in the Zoom group chat, which, you know, I, I really feel, really resonates in many of the conversations I've been having with colleagues. And I'd just like to pick this comment out, bring it straight forward and connect it to something that Mohammed was saying earlier on. Um, the, the, the comment is, what about being honest about, you know, and drained out, but there are deadlines and there's pressures to finish them. In addition, being afraid to be judged that you can't work under pressure and not qualified enough. This is a normal human fear that perhaps if we expose ourselves and we say we're not coping a little bit in our project or our program deliveries, then, you know, uh, maybe it might not go well for us. Mohammed, you live in the world of project and program deliveries. Tell me, how are you dealing with that in your world? Again, it's very important that leadership um, leads from the top and to express clearly that we are here first during these times to take care of each other and to take care of our own well-being. And it is okay to uh, be imperfect, but also it's not only because of the uh, benefit of any staff member, it is because of the benefit of the viability and the success of any business unit, whether it was a corporate or an organization, is to do a reprioritization exercise, is to see what is possibly uh, uh, we can do now after COVID. Uh, revise your work plans and revise your work plans in a collective and in a democratic way within the team, in the same way that you've devised them a year ago with the team when you had your own retreat. You, you talk about what is possible, what is not possible, and then in your own uh, performance documents, you readjust that. 
And then you, you need to be very clear always with managers that you need to give them, you need to give, to give your team the room to do it the way they can do it and the way they want to do it. So emphasizing more on managing by results and not necessarily managing by the five to eight or to the five, the eight to five, or uh, you didn't answer my email in 24 hours, uh, et cetera. So leadership has to lead the way there. Great, thank you. We've probably got time for one more question. Helen, you want to pull something from the- uh, Yeah, so there's one here, which I think is really interesting, but it's about how can we support the spouses, the partners of uh, some of, the, uh, of our employees. So for example, here the examples given, if, if you, you know, your staff member's working, but their spouse isn't working and they're already stressed with all the challenges that come from um, COVID-19 and perhaps they're not, being, they're not able to work so they don't have income coming in. How can we support um, the spouses? So this, I guess the broader family around our staff member, because clearly if the, the, the spouse or the rest of the family is stressed, that's gonna impact our staff member as well. So I guess it's one step removed from directly helping our staff to helping the broader, the, the, their broader family. Petra, let's start with you. Have you any advice in this, uh, from this side? And in particular, can you share any practices that you're seeing other organizations doing in this regard? Well, no practices as far as I know. But um, first of all, I think the working person in the household needs to be supported first. Then, of course, if there is a partner maybe who has lost or she has lost a job due to COVID or something, this is a very particular situation, but generally what we recommend is to have family conferences, okay? Uh, family conferences in a way that the family sits together to plan the day, to uh, set priorities, to give the worker free time to work, okay? Maybe when, when it's physically not possible or choose another room so that there are regular family conferences in the house and I like also one technique which is the thought of the day you know the best thought of the day to share that with each other so that there is some opening in this the um, yes you know I, I, I cannot even imagine imagine we have a woman she is uh, bearing all this the household the cleaning the children and so on the partner has lost the job and so on, and then needs support. Yes, he does need support, encouragement, let's say. Encouragement, look, sit down, write applications now, plan your life, where would you like to go, and so on. But this should not take a large part of the day because the other person is overworked already. So, and I think this needs to be just also discussed and just put on the table during the conference and say, look, I can't function like this at the moment, but I'm there whenever I have time. I'm here to support you. I we will read your applications if I have time and so on and so on because they're in this together because the working person needs to be encouraged because if that person also loses a job then the whole family is uh, in collapse okay so I hope you understand so it's it's a shuffling between you know leaving the person work and pulling her into the these problems okay thank you Petra Mohammed what's the UN doing to support spouses in this difficult time? I'll, I'll talk about what we're doing here. And again, very, uh, very practical down to earth uh, examples. We're offering counseling sessions to, to family members as well, whether it was spouses or children um, uh, to the extent possible. We're offering them uh, online resources. Uh, we do uh, half an hour of exercise three times a week, virtual for all the staff. Um, and we ask that their partners and their loved ones join us in that exercise. So they come on into the big screen and then we do the exercise together. Um, we um, ask our own team members to lead by example and to share the burden at home as well and we give them the time to do so. So we are flexible with them on the expectation that they are also partaking in the house chores. It's no excuse if your spouse is working or not to do more at home. 
you need to be part there. Um, and uh, the, the other um, uh, example that, or, or, or a tip that we've done is that now many of the schools are, uh, are off, so the kids are home. Uh, in uh, some of the countries now, we started the gradual come back to work. And I said to all the um, uh, staff who have kids who are sitting at home, even if their spouses are at home, not to report to work, to continue to work from home so they can support their spouses in taking care of the kids who are sitting at home. So that are some of the examples that we've been, we've been doing and really it's, it's at almost zero cost to the organization. Very good, very good, thank you. I do know from a CGIR perspective that there are many centres and alliances uh, who already have, uh, for some sectors of their workforce, um, you know, they're already providing through their insurance plans, um, counselling, uh, for spouses and partners and family members as well. So those of you online may wish to make sure that uh, uh, you speak to your HR teams about that. Um, and also, of course, that there may be a particular support that individual centres and alliances are doing directly. So we look forward to hearing if, if, uh, if any of those are available, we can gather together all those best practices as well. Now, although it's hard to believe it, we run out of time. <laughs> Again, <laughs> same as yesterday. We're just getting going and we've run out of time. Today was uh, the second run of our first webinar in GDI Experts series. Uh, we took the opportunity to explore wellness in these unusual times and to consider how we can best not only practice self-care, but also support our colleagues and our team members. Um, you will have seen down the right hand side, Helen's been busy summarizing all the great tips that we've got. So we will combine both the tips from yesterday and the tips from uh, today. We'll put them together and we'll share them widely. As we get ready to wrap up, we invite you to please share your feedback using the Survey Monkey link in the chat line on the right hand side because your feedback is very valuable to us. Um, thank you, Mohammed, for sharing your unique insights and, and your important learnings today. You've given us a lot of food for thought. I very much appreciate it. Um, and also thank you to Petra for helping us think through how we can practice self-care and support others, especially uh, support them in managing their mental health. Um, thank you also for helping us to highlight the confidential counselling support that we have available uh, for all our staff members. A special thank you to Helen for ably taking care of the chat line and for highlighting all the questions. And uh, finally, a very special thank you to the many folks who joined us today from all around the world. Hope you found the session useful. Please feel free to uh, keep up to date with GDI happenings through our webpage which can be accessed through cgior.org, as well as signing up for the regular GDI guides. Or you can just drop me an email on f.farrell at cgior.org. It'd be great to hear from you. Until then, take care, stay safe, and we'll talk soon. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Oh, before you go, oh, I'm sorry, I forgot something. Before you go, please put your cameras on. We'd love to see your face. <laughs> Look at you from all around the world. It's amazing. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Helen's going to do a very, very quick snap. So anybody who doesn't want their face uh, quickly snapped, turn off your camera. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Brilliant. Yes. Thank you so much, Helen. You got it. All right, brilliant. We welcome your feedback. Use the survey monkey. Take care, everyone, and enjoy what's left of your day. Bye bye. Okay, bye. Bye. Bye.